welcome to Doodle Therapy. It's great to see all of you here. Um, uh, welcome back to our wonderful drawing stream here on Adobe Live. My name is Alice Lee, and uh, today we have a very special guest, Ryan Putnam. Hello, Ryan. Hello. Um, we're gonna get to introducing ourselves in a second, but first I just wanted to say hi, and um, for everyone in the chat, welcome. Please feel free to introduce yourself and share where you're joining us from. We can get a little roll call happening. Um, and so if you're new to Doodle Therapy, basically this is an interactive drawing show here on Adobe Live, where we are all about coming together to doodle, experiment, have fun, chat about life, and just relax and chill. This is like a very, I feel, peaceful corner of the internet. So, um, yeah, it's great to see you all here. Um, and every week uh, we have a different drawing related theme. Um, and that theme corresponds with an activity that we can do together. So this week's theme is all about exploring color. And we have a, a fun interactive activity that you're totally invited to join us on. Um, and if you don't want to draw, that's also completely fine. Feel free to just, you know, grab a cup of tea and co work or just hang out and ask us questions. Um, so, uh, uh, without further ado, I'm going to just show some of, uh, Ryan's awesome work on the screen. Uh, Ryan, it's great to have you. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Cool. Oh, thanks for, uh, having me, Alice. Um, it's always fun to hang out with you. Um, so I'm a, a illustrator, designery, makery type of person. Uh, but I've worked mostly like my professional career within tech, some with Alice at Dropbox, but um, other kind of tech companies like uh, Facebook, Airbnb, places like that. But um, now I'm uh, back into freelance work and just making artwork and stuff. So um, nice to see everyone. Yeah. Um, hey to everyone who's saying hello in the stream. Ro Rochelle said this is her favorite Adobe live stream. Thanks for saying that. It's good to see you. And Natasha says howdy. And hey to Shauna, Shirley, uh, Amy, and Stone Cedar. Um, and Ryan, I'm going to brag a little bit on your behalf because um, you're super humble. Um, so <laughs> you can see some of Ryan's awesome work on the screen. Um, you know, he's a ceramicist. Uh, sculptural installation type of art, uh, as well as a really talented illustrator. We worked together actually at Dropbox pretty early on. Um, so we sat next to each other. And then when we both left, we started a studio space together. So I've actually worked next to Ryan for many years. And I would imagine that this stream will be like a day in the studio, an afternoon just making stuff in the studio, which is the closest that we can get to that for now because of COVID and all that. Um, and uh, I, as for me, um, I'm an illustrator and a muralist. I'm based in San Francisco. Um, so shout out to everyone who's watching from the Bay Area. Here's some of my work as well. Um, you may have seen my murals at the Asian Art Museum um, or this skateboard that I did for Dribble. And uh, yeah, it's just always great to see everyone and um, be back. So let's just get doodling. Um, so to start things off, I'm going to switch over to the um, uh, drawing screen now. Um, so uh, this is basically our prompt for this week. Um, we uh, are focusing on colors. So. Um, Basically, if you uh, would like to draw along with us, uh, this is kind of like a little starting point for, you know, some of the terms that we're going to use. So whenever we talk about color, um, it's very important to keep in mind this concept of a color wheel, uh, which is basically a representation of all the different colors in this circular format. And it's, you know, arranged sort of like how you would see a rainbow. Um, and if you are interested in, you know, checking checking that out more, you can go to color.adobe.com. It's a great resource. Um, and then uh, basically, just to start things off, um, what I have here are three colors that are the primary colors in the color space. Um, and you might know them as red, yellow, and blue. Um, however, if you're familiar with print, uh, 
the more specific terms are cyan, magenta, and yellow, and then K stands for black. And so basically, these are the building blocks for color. You can combine these basic colors to form additional colors. Um, so for this stream, we are going to be building a palette based off of these primary colors. And if you would like to draw along, you can check out our initial palette, which is linked in the description as well. Um, and so I'm just gonna really quickly go over a few concepts that I'll be touching on during the stream, just so that we're all on the same page. So you may hear me say um, the word temperature. And basically what that means is it's referring to the warmth or the coolness of a color. So in this case, for example, let's say I wanna pull uh, a magenta type of color. Um, you know, I have this, you know, more cool magenta, which basically means that um, it has more blue in it. Or you could pull a color, a version of this red that is more on the warm side. So it has more of this yellow tone. Um, and I think it's really helpful to keep in mind um, as we talk about things like lighting and um, just having a palette be in harmony. Um, and then the next two concepts that I really want to quickly go over are um, analogous colors and complementary colors. So what it means to have a color that's analogous is, let's say you're starting off with this um, red color here. Um, so let's just say, you know, we're pulling from here. An analogous color is basically a color that's near it on the color wheel. So I could go here and here and pull, you know, a, an a, a orange and a yellow. Um, and then a complementary color is basically an opposite. So let's say I have a purple here, all the way on the other side of the color wheel is yellow. And that's how you can create a little bit more uh, variance in your palettes. So if you'd like to follow along with our color explorations, you are completely invited to. Um, you can check out the link that's in the description for um, you know, the starting PSD file. And basically I think these concepts are really helpful to keep in mind. Um, I don't know about you, Ryan, but whenever I start with color, I'm not really thinking too much about um, these rules like explicitly, it's more intuitive, but it can be very helpful when you are editing and um, trying to start off to keep these in mind. So for example, if I was pulling you know, from this red color, uh, I might pick up a bunch of analogous colors to round out the palette and have it look related, related. but then I might pull a complementary color, an opposite color for that little extra accent. Um, so yeah, that's color theory in a five minute spiel. Um, I could go on for way longer about this, but you know, we don't have that time. So let me know if you have any questions in the chat. Um, Brian, do you want to have anything to add? No, that was great. Uh, it's always good to get a refresher for that stuff for sure. Sometimes <laughs> I'm not, uh, I don't remember all that stuff. Like you were saying, sometimes it just happens, but good to yeah. keep it um, in mind. Uh, so thanks for the refresher. Yeah, like when I am making color decisions, I'm not explicitly thinking like, oh, right, like time to add a complimentary color, you know? But sometimes if I'm stuck or if I feel like there's just something kind of off, it's helpful to think, you know, is the temperature of this particular color inconsistent with my whole illustration or stuff like that. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is we are going to be starting with this primary palette and uh, building off of that and evolving it to create our own illustrations. So if you would like to join along with our activity, um, please feel free to develop your own color palette. And if you share it with me on social media, you can tag me at by Alice Lee everywhere. Um, you'll be entered to win a giveaway. And it's always also great to see everyone's work. I think we've probably sent out over like 30 giveaway prizes over the last few months. So it's always really fun. Cool, so um, now that we've covered these color basics, Brian and I are going to uh, use this primary palette and jump into our respective illustrations. Um, so it's time to start drawing. Uh, what are you Whoa. thinking about working on today, Ryan? Um, you know, I I love the, the those primary colors that you pick. I, I work a lot where I'll give myself like really clear uh, constraints and it sometimes helps me you know focus on like the content first so I'm going to stick with those primary colors that you have and then 
try to draw something inspired. Well, I don't know. I, I think I'm like everyone where everything's going wild, stuff is happening. So I think it's hard to get away from like current events and stuff that's happening. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to draw uh, RBG, I think. Um, I'm using like a reference photo. Let's see if this is kind of, you can see this. Uh, but yeah. I, have my, I have my palette here that I'm going to take and I'm going to try to like draw her and, <laughs> and then see, see, uh, see how it goes. I know this is always kind of weird drawing live and, and stuff like this, but yeah, that's when we go. When you're drawing, when you're starting something off, how do you uh, first start to incorporate color? Do you do like a black and white sketch first or do you just kind of jump in and what's your process around that? I usually use, do a black and white sketch first, which I'll probably do here, like a pretty quick one. And then the way I'm gonna work with this thing too, with this portrait is being pretty quick as well. So it does usually start from a black and white sketch though. Cool. Um, yeah, rest in peace to the uh, legendary RBG, a uh, uh, great loss to our community. Yes. Um, and it's always really interesting, Ryan, to see how you uh, use color. I So having worked next to you for so many years, I know that you're really into um, risograph printing. And uh, I think that probably some of your color usage is influenced by that. Like I can totally see it. And just like the inks that you would typically use when you're doing Rizzo. Um, yeah, so it's cool to see. Yeah, totally. Um, and it's, that's why it's a great pick you did too with those colors, because those are Rizzo colors I have like you said. Yeah, and for those who aren't familiar with Rizograph printing, and Ryan, please correct me if I'm completely butchering this. Um, sure. It's a type of printing that is kind of old school and it like uses one ink at a time usually, or like maybe two. So basically if you have a multicolored, like if you want to print out this color sheet, you'd have to run it through the printer as many times as you have the inks. Like you'd have to run it once for like the yellow and then run it another time for like the blue, but then you can blend colors as well. And so, um, one thing, one cool thing I noticed about a lot of your work, since you do a lot of risograph printing, Ryan, is that um, a lot of your colors are related to the uh, Rizo ink colors that are, uh, you know, used for this type of printer. Yeah, for sure. And that sounds like a good kind of uh, quick description of risograph printing. It's almost like, uh, you know, in between like a Xerox print and a screen print. Um, so it does have the quickness of like a Xerox print almost, but it has some of the analog kind of tac tactile characteristics of a screen print. And you're mm -hmm. right that you do like one color at a time. Well, there's some risograph printers that could do two at a time, but it essentially, you'll burn an image on uh a roller or like rice paper and it goes on a roller and then it goes you know it prints through there uh, cool. <laughs> people are gonna hate me yeah, this description is probably horrible but then so yeah i'll do like one color at a time uh yeah it's fun it's fun like all these these prints and stuff around me these are all risograph maybe that one's not but the rest of them are risograph print that's really cool um yeah i love seeing your uh really colorful works and uh, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of tributes in the chat to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, rest in peace, a uh, warrior for uh, you know women's rights and the rights of um, underrepresented groups, um, and quite quite a loss. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of interesting yeah. because I saw someone in the chat say Leo say uh, RGB. So yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I mentioned earlier, you know, this CMYK uh, standard, which stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and K rep represents black. And so those are the inks that are used in a lot of traditional printing. So if you're doing a newspaper, you probably use CMYK inks because that's how like ink printing works. It's subtractive. But then if you're talking about color for screens, which is pixel and light, um, that's RGB, which is uh, red, green, blue. So it's a little, it's a little bit different. 
And um, as, it, as you can see on my side of the screen, I just picked out a couple of colors um, using this primary, you know, just eye dropping from it and either softening up the um, color a little bit. I wanted to make this red a little bit more on the cool side, for example. Um, and that's just my starter palette. It's kind of where my mind's at. And um, what I want to do uh, for this doodle therapy session is, so I noticed that there's a new iOS update that allows you to change your app icons to whatever you want, which is like so cool to me because obviously I'm going to, you know, paint something custom for my phone. Um, you know, with all respect to app designers, uh, there's a lot of, sorry, icon designers, there's so much crap that goes into that. Um, I wanted to uh, potentially just basically create um, tiny paintings uh, and those tiny paintings are going to be my app icons. And so this is my full iPhone screen. Um, so using this palette that I just really quickly developed with our color theory um, starter palette and this color wheel. Jeez, that's um, awesome. Yeah, so I think I'm just gonna, uh, you know, go for it with these colors. And my my approach is I've um, first sketched out, you know, this black and white underlying idea for this app icon. And uh, I think I'm just gonna go for it and start painting. And if you would like to also draw along, I've included this template in the um, the the folder as well. Um, Wow, Ryan, I love um, your progress on your piece so far. Oh, thanks. Just sketching it out. I always like how you pick your colors. There's so, like, <laughs> you know, I always say I like use restrained colors because uh, sometimes I feel like it's a deficit, <laughs> a deficit, you know, like I can't pick any other colors, so I'll just use the same old ones. But that's why I like your, your palettes are always pretty cool. Yeah, I like yours too. I mean, I, I wonder if, a lot of artists feel uh, that way of like, you know, I, I feel like I definitely have a crutch, you know, when it comes to color selection. I just go with these uh, these pastels that I simply love. Um, oh, yeah. But it, that's why I think it's cool to get inspiration from lots of different sources and, um, you know, open your open up your comfort zone a little bit. Um, Do you so, feel like it? Oops, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, go for it. I was gonna say, do you feel like, do you like that though? Cause it's like your stuff, do you feel it's, those colors are identifying part of like your style? Yeah, I mean, I try not to get too caught up with, this is a really interesting topic, the idea of a style. Um, yeah. I try not to get terribly caught up in the concept of a style, but I think that it is, you know, obviously, helpful in your career to have a distinguishable style that people know you for and um, you know that you're you're hired for basically what what are your thoughts on this uh, my thoughts I mean I think it I guess it depends kind of what discipline or kind of focus you're doing with illustration for maybe editorial illustration it makes sense to have a really clearly defined style um, I think as, as I've worked in tech, it seems like you should uh, be more, be able to be more flexible with your style to adapt to a brand or whatever the predefined style is. So I think it just matters, but like to have some underlying kind of, I think it's all that said, I think it is great to have like some yeah. kind of underlying style. Yeah, I, I see it as like a spectrum. Oh, and um, to answer your question in the chat, Ying, yes, we are both using Photoshop on Cintiq monitors. Um, and uh, I, to answer, your, to respond to your um, thoughts, Brian, I think that it's a spectrum. Um, I think for certain industries and jobs, like if you're in-house at a large tech company, for example, where there's a house style, uh, it's probably good to be more uh, multi-style, multi-disciplinary or multi, you know, be able to take on lots of different um, styles and wear other people's hats, for example. But um, I think if you're, for example, trying to be like um, 
uh, like an editorial or even like a muralist, I feel like mm-hmm. if you're trying to be known as an indie illustrator, like it's, it is quite helpful to have a style or a general sensibility and it's fine to change it too, I feel, but um, people come to know you. It's part of your brand almost. That makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, but but I, I think it's also important to not box yourself in and always keep evolving. Has having a personal style or kind of uh, ever uh, inhibited like oh, getting the yeah. job for you or anything? That's an interesting question. And um, now we're getting to my favorite part of the stream, which is basically just asking each other questions about our lives and our <laughs> careers. So if, if you're watching and if you would also like to ask um, similar sorts of questions, you know, feel free. Um, basically, uh, I think it's helped for sure, much more than it's hurt. Um, I've gotten jobs where they specifically wanted to hire me for my style, which is like the dream. Um, someone recently told me that they wanted to work with me because their team has a lot of um, women on the team and my style is very feminine and a lot of the other illustrators working in my space uh, tend to have very sort of masculine um, styles. Um, mm. So, you know, I like that because I think for a long time in the tech industry, I was told not to draw in such a feminine way. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like, I feel like that was the first, um, so Ryan and I worked at Dropbox from 2013 to 14. Then we both left within a year of that. Um, and I feel like the, for the first like three to four years, people, I would all constantly get the feedback of like, this looks great. Like the executive team is like psyched about it. CEO is like very excited. One thing though, could you make it like less, a little bit less feminine? Like, does it have to be more masculine, just more neutral? And, <laughs> and I'd be like, okay, sure. Um, you know, because I didn't know uh, really how to how to respond to that, but uh, I, I've since learned to you know embrace embrace my aesthetics, and if it doesn't fit for a certain project, that's totally cool. Like they should hire someone else probably. That's cool. Um, uh, Celia G says, "Hello, I is here to be therapized." Um, yes, welcome to our <laughs> relaxing corner of the internet. Um, I should probably say I'm not a licensed therapist, um, but. Uh, I found that um, drawing is a really relaxing um, form of self-therapy for myself. Um, and uh, to answer some questions from Caro's Designs, we are both using some teaks. I believe Ryan is using a 13 inch um, and I'm using a 22 HD. Um, cool, so uh, if you're just joining now, I just wanna give a quick update or a quick recap of like what we talked about. So Ryan and I are working on our respective illustrations. Um, I am creating a series of tiny paintings to serve as my iOS app icons, which apparently you can do now with the latest update. Um, and Ryan is creating a beautiful tribute to the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, may she rest in peace. And we are both uh, cre creating our illustrations using this starter palette that um, we have also linked to in the chat description. And um, as you can see, you know, I developed out this little palette. Um, and if you have any uh, questions that you would like to ask us about our work or life or just in general, like feel free, like I mentioned earlier in the stream, this is a really peaceful corner of the internet. We are chill. <laughs> has here one question has so you like to draw and stuff for just to relax and is it a, <laughs> maybe this is defeats this part but is it ever like stressful to you stress to, like, drawing yeah um, when does it get like too much yeah that's a great question because i know that a lot of people who watch the stream are uh, working illustrators or very serious hobbyists so some you know it, it's you can sometimes feel like drawing is like this task or obligation. Um, so, uh, and you know, I'm curious to hear your thoughts too. 
I think I've definitely had times where I simply could not draw because it was so tied with my career and job. And um, I was just not like, I was stressed and the world was crumbling and you know, it's it's been a really weird year. So there's definitely been days where I could not draw. Um, and I think that's very yeah. normal. Um, how about you, Ryan? Yeah, I think so. I mean, probably like, like you said, when it's directly correlated with work is when it gets stressful. Um, and I think, you know, I've been doing a lot of like abstract stuff lately. So I think that's like still feel, uh, fills the niche of, of like, I have to make something, but I'm not so worried about it being uh, super accurate or, mm. you know, looking like it's supposed to. That, so, or, you know, at work, someone's saying, draw this, draw this computer or something. I don't want to draw that anymore. Right. So, um, so yes, it can be sometimes, but that's when I transition just to like, I guess, drawing something else. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I'm curious if anyone in the chat has um, experienced this balance as well. Like, how do you, it's like a dance. Like, how do you find the balance between um, if drawing is also your career or an obligation with um, keeping your love for art alive? Um, and that kind of leads me into a, a related point, Ryan, which is um, how do you think about receiving praise on social media and how, do, how does that influence your work, if at all? Um, because I know that one thing, uh, one thing I've struggled with and one thing that I know is somewhat common of a struggle amongst especially younger artists is like, when you start to make things for Instagram or for Twitter and um, you kind of lose a little bit of that like sparkle of like when you were just making stuff that you really love to make um, and how do you balance sharing your work but not getting addicted or reliant on the applause basically? Yeah, it's hard. Um, uh, it's hard and I think you know, as much as you could disconnect yourself from what kind of feedback and stuff you receive on those platforms to why you're doing something in the first place is like super important. Um, yeah. And because, I mean, if I, it's weird because I use, I use social media as like a, a push to continue to like do more and explore more and stuff. But I also, keep it at arm's length because you know if someone doesn't like something uh some of the some of my favorite kind of pieces that i post are like no one likes it they're like what you know what the hell is this ryan what are Stay you doing here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine because it's like i didn't make it for those likes specifically um yeah i mean if someone does end up liking it that's great but uh it i don't know i don't know any specific like trick or you know s to tell anyone like do this if it happens it's like yeah. somehow you have to train yourself like to not care but <laughs> yeah easier said than done I what about that. you <clears throat> um oh van cornelius asks if doodle therapy has a social media page where we find all these resources. So unfortunately we don't. Um, the best way to just find it is in the uh, show description, um, which is linked in the text. Um, uh, however, if you are looking for something from a previous uh, episode uh, or stream, um, feel free to message me and I'm totally happy to uh, literally just send you the file. Um, and Shirley in the chat says, actually Michael in the chat, says they'll never forget the Dropbox downgrade upgrade fish tank illustration. Um, so hey <laughs> yeah. to Michael, and I did not make that. Did you do that, Ryan, or was that Zach? It was Zach Graham. Yes, um, good stuff. Shout out to everyone in cool. here who remembers vintage 2013, 14, 15-ish Dropbox. Um, oh man, was it that yeah. long ago? Jeez. Good stuff. Ooh. That's good. 
What about you, Alice? Do you, I mean, do you uh, have any, how does social media affect your yeah, well-being? Um, so my <laughs> approach, uh, you know, I'm not sure if this is really the best, uh, but uh, my approach is just not to post on social media when I feel this way. Um, mm. That's good. So it's just ignoring. Um, oops. Oh, by the way, what I'm doing here on the screen is a great example of, uh, you know, good color thought, but misplaced in terms of temperature. I added this leaf and you can see that it's uh -huh. way too warm, um, you know, in comparison to the environment around it. And so I need to uh, oops, cool it down a little. Um, so yeah, I just don't post or um, I'll do a little bit of soul searching. And I realized um, I actually did this exercise with my friend where I she asked me like, what's at the root? Like, what do you want out of like sharing your work? And then what's at the root of that? And what's at the root of that? Just tracing it down. Mm. And the um, realization that I had was I want to share my work so others can see it because I feel like it's a form of sharing love. Um, it's mm. my way of sharing love to others um, because I put a lot of my heart into my work, whether or not my work is you know positive or negative it could be something sad or angry or cheerful and, and delightful um, but regardless i put a lot of my heart into it and um, the whole point is to share love it's kind of like when you say i love you to someone you should try not to say it and like demand that they say it back if that makes sense <laughs> um and, yeah. and thinking about it that way actually really helps helped me um not feel so like tight in my chest, like anxious about, mm. um, you know, sharing and feedback and stuff like that. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. Are you, what are you, net, where are you at right now? Are you in a sharing mood or a... Oh yeah, sharing? I think I'm in sharing mood for sure. I've been trying, nice. um, I've been trying to actually post at least once a week on Instagram. I think before I was very perfectionist and I didn't want to, um, post my work unless I was completely happy with it. And now I'm just kind of like, whatever, like yeah. no one's perfect. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, how about yourself? Am I posting a lot of stuff? Yeah. Like how do you, th how do you think about that now? Oh uh, yeah. I post, I post a lot of shit. I mean, oops, I'm not sure if I can, cause <laughs> I post a lot uh -huh. of stuff for sure. Cause I'm always, uh, always experimenting. Um, and I think it's somewhat similar to you why I post. It's it's more for I enjoy this thing and I enjoy the people I follow. So here's something I enjoy, you know? Yeah. Um, um, so I tend to post a lot of stuff. You know. Oh no, did I get rid of my leaves? Um, Dennis in the chat says um, they low-key find it meaningful. I, li I like the use of the word low-key. They low-key find it meaningful to split the hours of the day to focus either on the like hobby for fun therapy side of the art versus the works of the art. Um, mm. And yeah, I feel that too. Um, I think it's kind of funny because, um, you know, at least I feel like I've done a good job in my career often of like essentially monetizing my hobbies. And <laughs> that's like good in a lot of ways, but also uh can be a double-edged sword and you the thing that you loved is now your job and that always sets up a weird relationship there totally totally i just don't want to i mean i think so i left my job uh Ooh, yeah a couple months ago and yeah i mean for a while there i mean i just don't want to like draw anything that someone asked me to draw it's like draw this thing i'm like no i don't i don't want to do that anymore but yeah. um yeah burnout is real i think oh yeah um thanks for uh calling it out catherine so basically i have this color adjustment window and i use it to um adjust the the hue, which um, can control the temperature, as well as the saturation and the uh, lightness. And it's just a really fast way to do it. I could also pull from this, I have this um, you know, little color color doodad here. 
um, and I could you know reselect the color. But it's actually a lot easier to I find move the color relative to where it was on these sliders as opposed to like picking a whole new thing. <clears throat> That's cool. Yeah. Um, Reverb Mike says, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I agree nice. with that, but That's I would too. add an asterisk <laughs> to that because um, doing what you love often requires a lot of admin and like paperwork. <laughs> For example, I, we're, Ryan and I are both freelance illustrators and you would think that um, 100% of our job is like drawing, like making cool stuff. But I would say probably 50% or more of my time goes to answering emails, coordinating logistics, um, scoping out projects, presenting my work to the stakeholders and you know, going through notes and feedback. Um, and then the remaining 50% is the physical act of drawing. Um, so it is really fun um, and it doesn't feel like I'm working often, if that makes sense, but um, there's a lot of like upkeep around that, um, that I didn't realize when I first went freelance that it would involve. Yeah, for sure. Let me know what you think. Like, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, Shirley says, LOL, the pain of being freelance and having to do admin work. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and I found that like, when you have bigger projects um, with bigger budgets, bigger scopes, you can actually hire out some of those things. Like I've brought on, I've hired assistants a few few times. I've worked with um, like agent type of um, like reps, like a PM sort of role. Um, but it's still, you know, it also requires a lot of um, thought and care uh, to bring other members of your team on to work with you um, because, and I feel you're probably the same way, Ryan, but like, I really care about someone's experience if they work with me, I want I want it to be like really good. Um, yeah. And so it, that takes a lot of, um, you know, time and energy to really make sure that things are good. Um, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, uh, Reverb Mike says, every hour of art requires four hours of prep. That's. Correct. That's very correct. Too real. Too real. David Lynch, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to be, I mean, honestly, I just want to, I'm trying to figure out if I could just become a full-time artist and I don't want to do like, I mean, I don't think it's possible, but any more client-based work anymore, but. Oh, cool. I yeah. I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, we have talked about this, um, actually. It's cool to hear your thoughts. Um, what do you, do you mind like sharing? Sharing, uh, too, uh, why? <laughs> like vulnerable, like, I don't know, I mean. What's your dream, I just, like? Just to like, I, again, I make a lot of different, uh, I do ceramics, I do painting, I do sculpture, you know, I just want to do all of that all of the time. Yeah. Rather than, uh, draw for other people anymore um but yeah haven't have it figured out <laughs> that's what i mean like you said that that's not just like you're doing art all the time even within that spectrum you have to um do a lot of admin marketing kind of like all that kind of fulfillment um of stuff but i guess that's you know you dream huh yeah totally um I mean, I, I feel that uh, a lot of my career goals artists uh, have some kind of balance of that. Like, um, have you heard of James mm. Dean? Mm -mm. Oh, I think you'd love his work. It's like wicked. Um, mm. He, uh, but he, but he, a lot of his work is creating, um, you know, prints and he just does like a print drop um, and people go uh. crazy. Like it's, it's really cool um, to see. And um I, I, when I think of like creative expression, I think of uh, his body of work, basically. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so I would cool. like to do that. Um, ooh, Michael, uh, who Michael uh, previously had said that they are familiar with the uh, Dropbox OG 
fish tank illustration, um, Michael nice. shared the same sentiment as you, Ryan, in that uh, they would love nothing more than become a painter who just shows them in public twice a year to hopefully sell a painting. Um, yeah. Yeah. There you go. We'll do it. <laughs> Let's all do it. Yeah, and I think um, for me, I'm probably, if you think of it like a spectrum of like completely fine artist all the way to um, very commercial uh, works with clients or is embedded in house on a team. Um, and you guys are talking about like this side of the like fine artist. Uh, I think I'm probably more in the middle. Like I like to do work with, um, you know, in teams and clients and collaborators. Um, and I think that it's like a good case for having a really strong artistic identity and a strong um, like brand around your style um, because I, uh, once if people kind of see you as an expert within your realm, they respect you and your artistic vision as such. But if they see you more as someone who can execute, um, then uh, it's more likely that, you know, you're, you'll have to always draw on someone else's hand, um, which I, I think some people are really good at, but I just know that I, uh, I'm very, uh, picky. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I mean, I think even just jumping back into freelance world, like illustrators, it's like, it is, it's a skill. It's a it's a very valued skill that sometimes doesn't feel valued much, but not a lot of people can do it. So if you're working with other, you know, product designers or PM, like they can't they can't do this stuff, you know. So i I'm running into a lot of people like, hey, draw what I want you to draw, you know, Knox like uh it's a delicate, it's a different, it's a delicate balance, I guess. Is, yeah, know, like sure. Saying. And Nina Morris in the chat actually has a great follow-up question, which is, do you have any advice on how to market your own artistic endeavors? Actually, this is a question I was going to ask you, Ryan, is like, how do you think about promoting your work? Because um, I know every artist has their own uh, approach to that. I guess it goes back to that <laughs> to that social media, like almost pretty much exclusively just like post stuff there. And I think I'm at the point of where I need more. Uh, uh, I need to learn how to promote better, to be honest. Uh, but oh, right now I just use the. Running your work. Oh, that, I, I mean, went like to you and uh, Amy at, for inspiration on like uh, prolifically sharing your work and confidently doing so. Oh yeah, definitely. Amy's like, she's awesome. I'm, de I'm definitely in awe of how she like um, builds out her all of her stuff. So I uh, always want to pick her brain more. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I don't. I just post a lot, and I think I need to be more intentional of like what I'm trying to get out of it. So. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, and Nina, to answer your question, I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, I think it's also a spectrum where on one end you have, um, you know, people who are more proactive about their work. So promoting their work. So, uh, for example, that could look like, um, directly reaching out actively to art directors you want to work with, like every quarter sending out an email to, you know, your dream clients, art directors, um, and being very, very proactive about finding the person who makes the hiring decision and like getting your work in front of them. Um, in the editorial industry, for example, so that's like newspapers, magazines, it's uh, very like normal and like encouraged to send art directors a postcard or email promos of your work regularly. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, it's a more like passive approach. So um, I think that's what Ryan is talking about more of, and that's kind of where I tend to be. So that's, um, I would describe that as laying, like planting the seeds that are going to sprout, not today, probably maybe not tomorrow, but like in the future. So posting your work on social media, you know, people will see that and, you know, save it to their mood boards or Pinterest boards or, you know, keep you in the back of their mind. And that helps you get uh, word of mouth. Um, 
doing a good job with clients so that they recommend you to more people in the future. So that's more of like the long game strategy. And I feel like I'm more on the passive side. And, um, but like once in a while I will like, you know, take the shot and like go for the active approach. For example, I've actually, um, I've cold emailed a couple of clients that I really, really have loved working with. And, you know, it all came from just going for it one day. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a mix of whatever you're comfortable with, I think. That's cool. Yeah, hopefully that resonates. And if anyone in the chat has their own thoughts about this as well, um, feel free to, uh, you know, share your approach and the mix that you like to do. Um, I also feel like I am a very, uh, like forward and aggressive is like the wrong word, but I'm very like proactive when it comes to people who've already like made the first move in reaching out to me. So I've had a couple like pretty big projects in my career where the other person reached out to me, but like they were talking to a few other artists, you know, or they weren't sure if like they were gonna go with me. And like, I was very um, proactive about like following up and being like, hey, you wanna like grab a coffee? Like, do you wanna hop on the phone and talk about this? And um, that that's something that I feel more comfortable with. Um, Mm. and as a form of being proactive without completely putting yourself out there, which I think feels scary to me. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going <laughs> to... Maybe this is a, a question for you, Alice, or anyone in the chat. I don't know how I'm going to draw the... Whatever that is around the collar there. What is what's yeah. that called? I, well, I feel I, like your line art style is going to look sick. Well, I think because so like, I, I guess I'll just do it really quick. I'll draw this. Okay, this is horrible, but I'm just doing it just to show. I get really tripped up like, you know, just like then it just doesn't look right. Oh. You know, that was a really quick version of it. So I'm having trouble. Maybe I could draw it straight and then just warp it. Yeah, well, there's a lot of like, mm. ooh, okay, this is cool. There's, I'm gonna just draw it on my side and you'll see it on the okay. screen. <laughs> there's a lot of like uh, cool lace patterns, like, um, you know, like this sort of thing. And then you can like play with the symmetry and stuff, you know? Uh, I'm not sure if mm. uh, uh, RB, RGB, sorry, RBG had a very specific type of lace. Um, you could, I guess, look up reference photos, but like, I think lace is like really cool to draw because you could basically like draw very intricate like patterns. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. so that's kind of cool. That's a good suggestion. So it doesn't necessarily have to even be whatever. I mean, the pattern in this picture, I can just draw kind of whatever you think. Yeah, I'm not too sure on her um, wardrobe choice. Like, I don't know if she only had this one style or if she had multiple. I know sometimes she's worn um, pearls a lot too. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're almost coming to the end of our stream. We've got about six, seven minutes left. Um, but I want to say that I really enjoyed this conversation. If this is real talk, this is like therapy to me. Um, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we have another question from angel asking do you guys did you guys ever have to do jobs where you didn't do art at all uh angel says they had to take on a job and they're struggling to see them to see themselves or uh do anything but art even if it's just a powerpoint presentation um and angel thank you so much for asking this question i think that it's really relatable and um we often see the like glamorous art making sad, like, oh, it must be so cool. You just draw all the time. Um, but I think it's actually way more common for people to have, um, to work for years and have a job that doesn't have anything to do with art. It's about, you know, covering your responsibilities and paying your bills. And I think that that's way more, that should be way more normalized to be discussed. So 
Thank you for asking, for sharing. Yeah, I've had, I've had a lot of jobs. Like, you know, I've worked in, I've been a busboy, I've worked in a kitchen, dishwasher, cook, you know, like, so uh, how I always looked at those jobs is like, those even though they weren't art focused they taught me so much you know actually like maybe so much more than some of these design art jobs that i've had so like even if it's like <laughs> just a job you don't want try to eke out anything you can from it like you'll learn something from any type of job even if it's not art um and even like some of the art jobs i've had <laughs> you know working at big these big tech companies, you do some kind of not so interesting stuff too. Like, so yeah, it's not, it's definitely not all just straight art work. And even to Alice's point of like a lot of admin stuff, even if you're in the freelance route too. Yeah. Um, Ooh, scallop yeah. design. Oops, sorry. Oh yeah, Catherine suggested a scallop design. Um, Sam says their non-art jobs have always been motivators to push their art even further to get to where they want to be with it. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, I think um, that's also a really good point. Um, yeah, you know, I think um, it's really hard to give specific advice without knowing, you know, one specific situation, but the one thing that someone once told me is if you are trying to get into an art practice um try every day even if it's just for like a minute of just like thinking about art um or you know drawing a funny like drawing a doodle in the shower or something you know in the steam like try to do one thing for yourself for your art like every day it could be really small really simple um it could be a thought um, and that just symbolizes like a commitment to yourself. Um, because I know, like, I think it's actually, you know, a, a huge privilege to get to do art and, um, to be in a position in your career where you can, um, do it. And I, I don't think that that's something that should really be taken for granted. So, um, yeah, I, that's just my advice. I hope that's helpful. I think that's my favorite almost some of my favorite uh, uh, suggestions I've ever heard. Shower, uh, what do you call it? Steam doodles? Steam doodles, yeah. yeah. I actually get a lot. <laughs> so like, I actually have had major breakthroughs like while showering and just sketching in the steam because it's, it's so weird. Wow. It's like, sometimes when you're working on a project, it's a really big deal. Like you can get a little bit like tight and like anxious when you're drawing on a, even with pencil. And when you're, when you're in the shower, it's like, it doesn't matter. Like. Just low stakes. Mm. Um, That's good. Do more yeah. shower, shower, shower. What'd you call them? Steam doodles? Steam doodles, shower doodles. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I've had some pretty good breakthroughs, those steam doodles. Um, don't count them out. <laughs> um, or even like playing with food. I used to do that when I was a student um, and not in high school. Um, Stone Cedar says all their life, no matter what their job or their work was, they always had time at night for open mic. Same thing, work with what, what one has. Um, yeah, and I would also say to not feel bad about it if you need to take a break from art, because um, I see it, I see like art as like a relationship that I'm in. Like it's a, it's a relationship with myself and this is a relationship I want for a long time. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So if it's a point in your life where it's just really hard to draw every day, and I don't even draw every day, you know, and I'm like a professional illustrator, like, um, then that's okay to take a break. It's totally fine. Um, and it's actually healthy. So, yeah. 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 So, you know, we're almost reaching the end of our stream. We've got about um, two more minutes. Um, and just to recap, you know, all the ground we covered today. So talked a little bit about color theory and how to break down thinking about palette and thinking about, you know, what works with the colors that I want to use. Um, and then Ryan and I use this starting point, primary uh, color palette to uh, create some illustrations. So Ryan is drawing a tribute of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and I 
am creating a set of uh, mini paintings that are going to be my iOS app icons because you can um, change those to whatever you want now. So if you also drew along and created your own palette, uh, feel free to tag me um, at, at @bialislee Lee on Instagram, Behance, Twitter. You can message me on Behance. I would love to see it. Um, it's always great to see this community's um, you know, creations. We will be back here tomorrow at the same time at 2.30 Pacific time for another uh, chill hour of drawing. Um, thank you so much to our amazing guest, Ryan Putnam for joining and dropping some wisdom on us today. Um, yeah, and thanks to all of you for joining us in the chat. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye, thanks for having me. Bye bye. Have a great day.